Hi Prince Street, it's Samantha here. Originally, I was going to be with you guys this Sunday speaking, um, but like a lot of the plans in this season, um, that has been postponed. So hopefully I'll be able to do that soon. But for now, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update of how ministry has been going. Um, Young Life often says that it has a, a step ahead of the world because kids are always in their phones and always engaging in not really authentic relationships. And Young Life is a way to provide authentic, real relationships with kids. Um, but right now, we're in the same boat as everything we usually compete against. Um, phones are our main source of connecting to kids, which has been certainly a challenge. Um, but it has had a whole new set of fruit that we weren't expecting. There's kids that I haven't seen in years who are graduated now. Um, girls that I know that are still at the high school but don't really come around as much anymore that I've been able to text or FaceTime or reach out to or call. And they've been super excited to talk with me um, and just vent about this weird season that we're in. And so that's been really cool. I've been connecting with girls that I haven't been able to connect with as much. Uh, we also have been doing this thing on Instagram. There's a live function. And so on Monday nights, we've been doing Instagram Live Club which is we have games and fun activities and then a really, really short message. Um, we've been instructed to keep it around three to five minutes because high schoolers really, especially on a phone, their capacity to pay attention is even less than normal. Um, but it's been really fun. We've seen kids come out to that that normally don't. Um, some of our introverted, kids have the chance to check out what a Young Life Club might look at without the intimidation of walking into a big room of people. Um, so it's been really fun. We've just been trying to come up with new ways and connect with kids in whatever way we can. Um, a couple things that you guys can be praying for. Young Life as a mission right now is praying through whether or not we will have summer camp. Um, I personally don't think we will but we are trying to think through what are ways we can engage kids or do like a mini camp weekend or things like that this summer. So I just ask that you guys would join us in praying for that. Um, summer camp is where kids get to hear the gospel clearly laid out day to day. Um, and so we're gonna have to be thinking creatively about other ways that they can do that. Um, yeah, so that's really all I have for you guys. I wish I could be with you. Um, have a great weekend. Bye. Good morning, Prince Street Church. This is Pastor Seth here, and I'm just going to open with a word of prayer before Pastor Mike gives the message laid upon his heart for this week. So if everyone bows their heads with me, uh, let's just open a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we can pray together, that we can worship and glorify you together. Uh, even though we can't do it in person. We just thank you that we can be unified in our prayers, in our worship, in our studies. We just want to be praying for those that are in need, that you, that they see your comfort, that they see your love, that they see the ways that, that you're providing, God. Uh, we just want to be praying for those that are sick, just provide healing. For those that aren't sick, just safety from the sicknesses and viruses going around. Uh, we want to be praying for those who are facing loss in their family. Just give them your your love and your comfort, God, and, and help others to be able to come around them too. Uh, and help us to just be the loving body of Christ that you want us to be in those situations, God. Uh, we just want to continue to ask for, uh, for wisdom for our leadership, not just in our church, but in our community and around the world, God, with all these things going on, we definitely need to turn to you for wisdom. God, we just lift up all these things. We lift up those who are still working, that are out and about interacting with people, that you provide them safety and their family safety. And we just ask that we keep our eyes set on you, God. 
in these times, after these times, help us to be focused on you, God, and worship and glorifying you. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Good morning, Prince Street Church. We continue to wander our way through this uh, quarantine, and I appreciate that we are getting together in one shape or another. So it's uh, great to hear from Samantha and all that God is doing in her ministry. She normally would have been here on Sunday, but we all know what happened. So she will uh, come to us again sometime, maybe in 2021. So we'll see her around, and uh, good to hear from you, Samantha. So we're going to continue our series in Matthew, and uh, the Son of David is our series in the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to look at kind of talking a little bit about what I talked about last week, reading the gospel. I'm going to touch on some of that, and I'm going to give you some really good specifics. So as we get into this passage, I want to just talk about signs. We in America, we live with signs, all kinds of signs. This is a picture of the um, Times Square in New York City. Right now, it's, it's weird seeing pictures of Times Square because there's nobody there. And uh, again, because of all that we're going through. But when you go to Times Square, it's overwhelming the number of signs. They're everywhere. And now with the advent of digital signs, they are flipping and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Signs are ubiquitous in our market-driven society. Now think about signs. Just a few examples of how we use signs and how they sometimes use us. There are signs of directions, for directions. In other words, when you're driving along, and if you are the stubborn person who doesn't use GPS, and even if you do, and they don't warn you in enough time, and you're in some crazy traffic, there goes the exit. Thankfully, it starts telling you, you know, recalculating, recalculating. But we have signs for directions. They help us get to places that we want to go to. That's the whole point of the sign. There are signs for advertising. You know, in America, anything and everything can be advertised. Even churches have gotten into all of this advertising. You drive down the road and there's the billboard. A church is advertising. Then, as we come to this passage, when we look at it, see, there are signs that ask for something. There are signs that ask for something. Think about this between a man and a woman. Think about it. Just give me a sign that you still love me. Or maybe you might hear something like this between warring factions. Show us a sign that you really mean peace. And then finally, more fitting with our passage, give me a sign, or what it really means is give me proof that you are who you say you are. And what's amazing, if you need to make any changes to a bank account or something dealing with personal information, you have to go down all those security questions. You know why? And thankfully they're there is because they want to know that you are who you say you are. Signs are ubiquitous. They're everywhere in our market-driven society. So we come to this passage, and I want to talk about sign seekers. Sign seekers. 
people who are always looking for a sign. Well, when we get into this passage, and I'm going to read it in a minute, we need to keep a few things in mind, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Follow along as we read chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. And Jesus replied, When evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today, it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You Pharisees and Sadducees, do you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, a sign in the heavens? But you cannot interpret the signs of the times. We'll touch on that a little bit. And he says, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for miraculous signs, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. It's like he turned on his heels and said, adios. When they went across, and again, Jesus and the disciples after that, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. They forgot to take some food. And Jesus says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You got to love the disciples. They discussed this among themselves and said, is it because we didn't bring any bread? Oh, we're such knuckleheads. Aware of this discussion, Jesus asked, now come on, you got to see the humor in this. You of little faith, why are you talking about among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets were gathered or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls are gather, you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking about bringing your lunch, about bringing bread. Isn't that amazing? But he says, but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then, then the light goes on. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This passage is all tied together by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Normally, these two groups butted heads politically. They didn't normally work together, but you know how it works. When you have a common enemy, boy, that brings people together. A common enemy, and it was Jesus. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they come to Jesus, what? Asking for a sign. So now, looking through this passage, remember what I said last week when you read the Gospels, is right now, you have to keep at least, at the very least, three stories rattling around in your brain as you read this passage. The first one is the testing of God by the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. Jesus, the very incarnate God, remember the last passage, is that Israel celebrated and praised the God of Israel. He was in their midst, the incarnate Jesus. He was there, the God of Israel. See, so you have to keep in your mind you're reading this because it says that the Pharisees and the Sadducees representing Israel, it says they came to Jesus te and tested him. 
So keep the wilderness story of the Israelites wandering through the desert, testing God every step of the way and driving Moses crazy. The testing of God by Israel. Then the second story you need to keep in the back of your brain are the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. See, the devil begins each testing temptation with, if you really are God's son, then. And finally, the third story you need to keep straight is the story of Jonah the prophet. You know Jonah and the whale. Well, we don't know if it was a whale, but it was a great fish. So we have to keep the story of Jonah. Well, then Matthew, verse an explanation of the sign of Jonah. So why is asking Jesus for a sign of a wicked and adulterous generation? Why is it asking for a sign the act of a wicked an adulterous generation. And why is that so important today? Well, as we look at the first three verses, sign seekers, what happens? Sign seeking exposes our control. And what I really want to say is our need for control. Notice that the Pharisees and the Sadducees in verse 1 came to Jesus and what? Tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. They were testing him. See, we, those of us who look for signs, we are in fact the ones that we think are in control. We are the ones calling the shots. Show us a sign from heaven. We may not say it that way, but notice that with these leaders, it really wasn't a request. It was a test. It was a demand. We know what's going on and we are in charge. So you, Jesus, are required to prove your claim of authority to us. We're the ones in control. We're the ones in power. We will ask the questions. Wow, this is the devil's voice of control and power. It's exactly how the devil acted with Jesus. Well, will we be surprised? Well, we shouldn't be because Jesus, the incarnate God, is being asked by these leaders just like the devil did in the wilderness. So who acts like they're in charge today? How does this reflect on us or on our culture, on our people. Well, those who think they're in control and those who think they're in power. See, those of us who claim to be Christians and get involved in power politics, so prevalent today, will be held to a higher standard of guilt because we know who is really in control, and he didn't use power politics. You know what I mean by that? You know what the sign is right here? The sign of the cross was Rome's power politics. From Rome's perspective, the cross was a sign of absolute control and power. Rome is in charge and you aren't. See, sign seekers, we become a wicked and adulterous generation because it exposes our need for control and power. And when we fall into that, 
We're not only acting like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we're acting like Rome itself. Because from their perspective, the cross was power politics. From our perspective, completely different. But we'll talk more about that in a bit. So why? Why does the act of asking for signs expose a wicked and adulterous generation? It's, it's as though they're already wicked and adulterous, so therefore they ask for signs. See, this works together because sign-seeking exposes our desires for what they really are. Jesus calls them, a, in verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for miraculous signs. See, adultery throughout the Old Testament often refers, and most of the time refers, to idolatry. Now let me explain what that means, is that cheating on God, being unfaithful to God with other gods, was often said to be adultery. You get that? And yet in our hearts, and maybe theirs, they say something like, well, let's just make sure we have all our bases covered. It won't hurt to have a few other gods covering some of the things. And now the other story we have rattling through our brains, not only the devil's testing of Jesus, but also the Israelites in the wilderness testing of God. See, like the Israelites in the wilderness, we have trust issues. We need a sign to make sure. Let me give you an example of something that is fairly recent. See, when a child has a vision of heaven, we clamor to read it and see it because it reassures us. But let me remind you that Mormons and Muslims in many, many, many religions of this world have visions too. Now is that reassuring? Signs can seductively take on a life of their own and become idols. For example, the thought of humbling, I mean, think about this. The thought of humbly growing in your faith through prayer, through service, through community and self-sacrifice in the midst of a trial is quickly abandoned for the need of a miracle. See, miracles are what I call a jolt of spiritual espresso. We are so susceptible, just like the ancient Israelites, to this need for signs because we have trust issues. So no wonder Jesus says a wicked and adulterous generation seeks signs because we're like the devil himself. We're like the Israelites who have trust issues and the devil who has power issues. But it doesn't stop there, does it? We get to that last big passage about yeast, about leaven. See, sign-seeking infects everything. Jesus warns them about the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the very ones who demanded a sign from Jesus. A sign from Jesus. See, it's a great image of yeast or leaven because it permeates the dough. It gets into everything. Sign seekers in their teachings spill over into everything. In our secular age, God has become like the absentee father so many dysfunctional families experience. So when someone writes about a vision or miracles, we get all excited. He's back. We act like the child who longs to see their father when their father has been there all along. 
See, spirituality of signs has become acceptable in our yeast-infested, permeated, secular age. But let me remind you what Jesus says at the end in what he's very pointed about in verse 4. All of this is challenged and changed by one sign. And you know what that sign is? It is the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah. What I love about the sign of Jonah is when Jesus says, even though you can't tell a hoot about what's going on because you can't even figure out the signs of the times, what's going on right in front of your faces, you're blind. They prove that. But I love thinking back just a few passages. Remember the Canaanite woman? She could see. She could read the signs. But look at what he says to them about Jonah. Is he says that he, he, will give them this sign. Not because they asked for it. Not because they demanded it. But because they had no idea what he meant. (laughs) Because it was a sign they never would have ever asked for. The sign of Jonah. This sign was given, not sought. They would have never picked up on that. My suggestion to you is that you go back and read Jonah. Go back and read it. I want you to read it with new eyes. It would only be after the resurrection that many would see and understand who Jesus was and is. And they would understand this Jonah sign. So let me explain it to you. We've already looked at the parallels of the Israelites testing God in the wilderness, seeking signs, and the devil himself testing Jesus, the Son of God, asking for signs. Prove yourself. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, doing the exact same thing. Because they're standing right in front of the God of Israel incarnate in his son. The sign of Jonah. Because of the resurrection, we look backwards, don't we? It takes the resurrection and reading backwards in order to understand that Jonah is a sign of the resurrection. Come on, get your minds around this. We look back to understand, and then we understand to look forward. How does this work? It takes that resurrection, the blindness, the scales to be removed. Think about it. Jonah. Jonah is in the ship running from God. Now, Jesus isn't running from God, but think about how it's set. Jonah is in the boat, and a huge storm comes up. The sailors are scared to death, and Jonah knows why the storm is happening. And Jonah says, sacrifice me, throw me overboard into the deep. Sacrifice me to save yourselves and throw me into the deep. The deep, the sea, the great symbol of death. Read your Bible. Jonah is thrown overboard. And the calm comes and the sailors are saved. And yet Jonah in the deep is gobbled up, swallowed, whatever, protected 
In the end, we find out by this great fish for three days. And then this great fish vomits him out. Vomits him out onto the shore of Nineveh. And then Jonah goes to Nineveh. And the pagans, the enemies of Israel, <laughs> repent. And God is merciful to them. Can you see this? This great sign of the resurrection. Jesus was thrown overboard. Jesus was thrown into the deep of death for three days, protected there in the tomb. And three days later, vomited out of the tomb. He comes out. And the world has changed forever. The sign of Jonah now, here's the great irony of this message for sign seekers is in Christ, we are the signs we seek. See, new life, resurrection life is what this world needs. The very signs we seek are us that we might be signs of new life for this world. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your mercy, for your grace. I thank you for the sign of Jonah that Jesus, you rose from the dead, that three days later, the tomb could not hold you any more than that fish could hold Jonah. And you came forth for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'd like to dismiss you. <laughs> Maybe you're going to go to the kitchen. Maybe you're going to go to the family room. Maybe you're going to go to the basement. Maybe you just are going to sit there. But I'm going to dismiss you with a benediction. Because I love you, miss you. And praise God, one of these days we will be together and I'll get some of those big hugs from Quentin and some of the other people that I long to see. I long to see all of you, <laughs> even with my blurry vision, with my reading glasses. But be dismissed with this benediction. Grace be with you all that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen, brothers and sisters. Go in peace.